classes can have various relationships with each other. And three of the most common relationships are dependency, aggregation, and inheritance. In dependency, uh, class A uses class B. In aggregation, class A has a B. And inheritance, class A is a B. So first, inheritance is discussed in great detail in chapter eight, and it's one of the um, main tenets of object-oriented programming. Let's discuss dependency and aggregation first. A dependency exists when one class relies on another in some way, usually by invoking the methods of the other class. We've seen dependencies in many previous examples. I believe it was the coin class was dependent upon the math class, etc. Uh, we don't want numerous or very complex dependencies among our classes. However, we also don't want compact, complex classes that have no dependency on others. So there's a balancing act and a good program design strikes the balance between too many or too complex dependencies among classes or having very complex classes that have no dependencies or minimum dependencies on others. Some dependencies may occur between objects of the same class. For example, a method of a specific class may accept an object of the same class as a parameter. Probably the most obvious example is the concat method, which concatenates two strings. And it's a member, uh, I'm sorry, it's a method of the string class. And it takes as a parameter another string object. So here's a, here's a dependency between objects of the same class. And it drives home the idea that the service is be, being requested from a particular object. Next, we're going to look at an example uh, that defines a class called rational number to represent a rational number. A rational number is a value that can be represented at the, as the ratio of two integers. Okay, some methods of the rational number class accept another rational number object as a parameter. Next, we're going to take a look at. Next, we're going to take a look at the driver program. Uh, it's called Rational Tester, and it um, uses many of the methods in the rational um, rational number class. Here we see um, the constructor. You'll see six eight, and that gets reduced before it gets um, printed. That'll get reduced to three over four or three fourths. R2, new rational number, one third. And then we're going to declare some other rational numbers. Um, that will get assigned different objects as we move forward. So print out first rational number R1, second rational number R2. Uh, then we call the is like, okay? And if R1 is like R2, remember that turn, returns a Boolean, we'll print R1 and R2 are equal. Uh, otherwise, we'll print R2 and R2, R1 and R2 are not equal. They are not equal in this example. Then uh, we call a reciprocal, uh, R1 reciprocal, and we assign that to R3. And then uh, R1 calls the add, and we add R2, and we assign it to R4. Um, R1 subtract R2. R1 multiply R2, and you can see what's happening here. And then we'll just run all this uh, and show you how this works. I'm not going to spend a lot of time running it multiple times. I just want you to see um, first rational number three quarters, second one third, 
remember it was 6 eighths and it reduced it R1 and R2 are obviously not equal this reciprocal of R1 is 4 thirds okay R1 plus R2 13 twelfths R1 minus R2 5 twelfths R1 plus R2 1 quarter R1 divided by R2 is 9 quarters Here's a new concept, aggregation. <clears throat> an aggregate is an object that is made up of other objects. Therefore, aggregation has, or is a, has a relationship, as in a car has a chassis. So a car could be an object, and a chassis could be an object, and a car has a chassis. Um, an, aggregate, an aggregate object contains references to other objects as instance data. And I'm going to show you a specific example in um, a few minutes, or actually a few seconds. The aggregate object is defined in part by the objects that make it up. This is a special kind of dependency. And the aggregate usually relies on the objects that compose it. Let's take, I know that sounds... Um, confusing, but let's take a, a closer look right now and you'll see it's really not that uh, complex. So here we have an example of an object of the club member class. And that club member is going to have some instance data that is um, string that's first name, last name is a string. And then it's going to have a home address and a work address, but those are address objects or, yeah, objects of the address class. And so the address class has instance data, street address is a string, city is a string, state is a string, zip code is a long integer, and it also has a method to string. So the data the instance data of a club member object includes objects of the address class. Next, we take a look at the this reference. This can be a little confusing. <laughs> the this reference allows an object to refer to itself. So when this reference, the this reference, is used inside a method. It refers to the object which the method is being executed for. So, for example, we have um, a method called try me. And let's suppose that try me uses this reference, the this reference, inside of it. So obj1.tryme invokes the try me method and it refers to obj1 when obj2 invokes the try me method it revert it refers to obj2 i'll show you more in the next slide so here's an example of an alternate constructor for the account class we reviewed earlier it could have been written as follows. So this.name equals name. So whatever object was invoking this um, constructor, uh, that object's name becomes name, and name is the actual um, parameter. This.account number, this.balance, etc., etc. So we've already discussed some high-level design issues that include identifying our primary classes and the objects that we will be creating with those classes, <clears throat> and then the actions those objects will be performing, the primary responsibilities, which is the methods. So after we establish um, 
you know, the high level mile high design view, we need to get to lower level issues such as how key methods are to perform. So for some of our methods, those that are um, core competencies, if you will, of the class, um, we need to carefully plan to make sure that they're coded efficiently and they provide an elegant design solution. And this is of critical importance. Although you can go back and modify methods, um, you are somewhat locked into uh, how they were or what tasks they will perform once they've started to be used uh, by other objects, by objects, I should say. If you're in this class, you've been exposed to algorithms and you've written algorithms, especially if you had me for the prerequisite course, of which I've taught many, 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 many sections. So this, is, this should all be review for you. An algorithm is a step-by-step -step process for solving a problem. You know, some examples of everyday algorithms are a recipe or travel directions. So every method that we design implements an algorithm determining how the method accomplishes its goals. And we oftentimes write an algorithm or express an algorithm in pseudocode, a mixture of English statements and code. So it's not syntactically correct, but it's a mixture of English statements and, and code statements, keywords, etc., that communicate the steps um, we take in that the method performs. In the prerequisite course, we discussed at length stepwise refinement, top-down design, which is um, taking a problem statement and, de statement and decomposing it into smaller tasks. So if you find yourself coding a method and it becomes very lengthy or very complex, most likely it should be broken down into smaller tasks implemented as simpler methods. Um, so a public service method of an object may call one or more private support methods just to help it accomplish its goal rather than uh, putting all of those tasks coded into the single method, okay, support methods are very useful. And support methods might call other support methods if appropriate. And this is, this is a key example of stepwise refinement, top-down design, breaking the problem statement down into smaller, easier to accomplish and code tasks, which ultimately can become small methods. Next, we're going to take a look at an example that requires method decomposition. And that is, I can't believe we're doing this, translating English into Pig Latin. Yes. Um, this came, this exercise came with the textbook support materials. So uh, I didn't, I didn't bring this into the class as something that I thought would be a good idea, but, but just bear with me. Pig Latin is a language in which each word is modified by moving the initial sound of the word to the end and adding I. Uh, when we were kids, when I was a child many years ago, uh, we would spend hours talking in Pig Latin, groups of young men at that point in time walking around the town. But yeah, so here we are. Words that begin with vowels have the yay sound added to the end. Um, so words that begin with consonants, we move the consonant consonant to the end. So book becomes ook bay, item becomes item yay, table, able te, chair, air che, etc. So the primary objective uh, which is to translate a sentence 
in English to Pig Latin is too complicated for one method to accomplish. Therefore, we look for natural ways to decompose the solution, break it into smaller pieces. Translating a sentence into Pig Latin can be decomposed into the process of translating each word included in that sentence. The process of translating a word can be separated into trans translating words that begin with vowels or begin with consonant blends, SH, CR, TH, etc., or begin with single consonants. Next, we're going to take a look at the uh, coded solution for this. Here we have the Pig Latin Translator class. Um, first thing I want you to notice is the first method declared in this class is a static method. And recall, a static method doesn't require an object of that class to call it. You can simply use the class name and put the method call on the right-hand side of an assignment statement if it returns a value, and this one does, it returns a string. The parameter or argument passed to this static method is a sentence, I'm sorry, a string that uh, the parameter name is sentence, formal parameter name is sentence. So I'll walk you through this. It declares a string named result, which is really empty. That's gonna be used for the return. It then uh, converts the sentence to lowercase, eliminating any capitalization, signs it back to sentence. Then we declare a new scanner object named scan. And recall, a scanner object can be used to solicit input from the keyboard or another input device. Uh, but in this case, it's going to be um, using a string. So the scanner object will use sentence in this case. So, real simple. We go into a while loop while scan.hasnext why I can get another um, uh, input from the, uh, from the string. In other words, another series of characters that look like a word separated by a, uh, by a space. Um, result plus equals translate word, which is a service method, scan.next. So next we'll get the next series of characters and end at a space and pass it to the service method translate word. So translate word translates a single word into Pig Latin and it uses itself three service methods. So here's translate word. If begins with vowel is a service method that returns a boolean. And we'll take a look at that in a second. So if the word begins with a vowel, result equals word plus yay. Example is, is, is yay. If it begins with a blend, br, sh, tr, etc., um, the result equals word dot substring two. So zero and one are ignored, and it will take um, index two to the end. Plus word dot substring zero, comma two. It'll take zero and one. Um, plus a Y. Else, it begins with a consonant. There's no um, service method necessary for that. And we're going to look at begins with vowel and begins with blend in a second. But if it begins with a consonant, word substring one, starting at index one, so ignoring the consonant at the beginning, to the end, plus word char at zero, which is the consonant, plus a Y. And here we have the static Boolean begins with vowel. Um, and it basically compares uh, 
the word at character zero um, with AEIOU. And if it finds that that's true, um, means it will return the index not equal to negative one, which is means it didn't find that character in the string. So anyway, um, and here's the static Boolean begins with blend. And here's all the possible blends that the, uh, the word may begin with. And if it does begin with one of those, then you saw what happens. And that's it. This is a very elegant solution to a problem that's probably more complex than anything we've seen so far in this class. Next, we'll take a look at the driver program that runs this uh, translate program. Here we're taking a look at the driver program or the application that utilizes the Pig Latin Translator class. You can see I'm importing Pig Latin Translator dot asterisk. I put the Pig Latin um, Translator class in its own package in this project. Um, also import java.util.scanner so that we can solicit input from the keyboard. So it's a fairly straightforward, simple program that leverages the um, methods in the Pig Latin Translator class. We declare string, sentence, result, another. Another is simply used for the do while loop. You'll see that in a second. We declare a new scanner object named scan. And this scanner object is um, connected to the input device, the keyboard. And then we simply enter a do while loop. System out print line. Uh, system out print line prompt the user to enter a sentence with no punctuation. And then sentence equals scan dot next line. We will um, solicit an entire sentence and store it in the string named sentence. Print a blank, print a blank line, and then simply take the return from the Pig Latin Translator translate method. Remember, that's a static method, so we don't need to call it with an object. We don't need to create a Pig Latin Translator object using the constructor. We just simply call translate. We pass um, the argument or parameter sentence and sentence will be translated into Pig Latin. Now remember, we just went through that entire class and all the service methods that get called in order for this to happen. Then send some output to the monitor. That sentence in Pig Latin is, and then system out the print line result. Print another blank, blank line. Prompt the user. Um, uh, a question, do you want to translate another sentence, yes or no? And then another dot scan, I'm sorry, scan dot next line gets whatever the user types into the string another. And while another dot equals ignore case, so they can type a capital or a, a lowercase y, and this will continue to loop. I'll run it now for you. Here you can see, enter a sentence with no punctuation. A long sentence in English. And is they, is they, <laughs> is Tay, is he, is ye, a ye, ong lay, et and say, in ye, English ye. My pig Latin is a little rusty, sorry. It's been probably, well, many decades since I've practiced pig Latin. 
Anyway, I hope this was useful. As always, these files, the driver program, and the class are in the timeline in Canvas. I strongly encourage you to put those into a um, Java project, run them, and see for yourself firsthand how this thing works. Here's a UML diagram depicting the method decomposition. Um, look to the right, you'll see the Pig Latin translator. Um, notice that the plus and minus next to the method indicates whether it's public with a plus or private with a minus. And the only public method, uh, which is still a static method, is translate. And translate um, is decomposed to translate a word and translate a word is decomposed to words that begin with a vowel, words that begin with a blend, and the default is obviously, if neither of those is true, it begins with a consonant. Let's discuss objects being passed as parameters to other methods. And I'm gonna ask you to recall the lessons on passed by value and passed by reference from the prerequisite course for this course. So we have to address this issue related to uh, method design. How are parameters passed? Well, parameters in Java, and I'm sorry, parameters in a Java method are passed by value, which means a copy of the actual parameter is stored into the formal parameter. So therefore, when you pass, when, you, when passing a parameter in Java, it's similar to an assignment statement. The value in the parameter is used as an assignment for the initial value of the formal parameter. It gets a little wordy. Um, I prefer the terminology in C++ as a, um, an argument formal parameter, but in this case, we're using the term parameter and formal parameter. So here, we're going to pull together several concepts that we've been discussing. When an object is passed to a method, the parameter and the formal parameter become aliases of each other, meaning the um, formal parameter will become an alias of the object that was passed as a parameter. And what the method does with a parameter may or might, may not have a permanent effect. So we need to note the difference between changing the internal state of an object versus changing which object a reference points to. Very significant difference, and we're going to look at a coded example next. Now we're going to take a look at a Java program that demonstrates um, passing primitive variables versus object reference variables as parameters to methods. <clears throat> this one sets up three variables. One is a primitive variable, an integer, and two are objects, which are in essence object integers. The data that those objects contain is one integer, and there's some methods associated with them. And then we're going to pass them to a value of I'm sorry, a method called change values. So I've got some breakpoints in this program. There's a lot of moving parts, so pay attention. And as usual, I'm going to download these, um, the, the application and the two classes that are part of this project. And I'm going to encourage you to run this on your computer at home. So I'm going to come over here, and we're going to go uh, to debug. So we'll stop at the breakpoints, and you'll see I have a breakpoint here before my first output, but I can take a look at my variables. So I've got a1, an integer, 
holds 1, 1, 1, 1. A2 is a num object, and if I expand it, you'll see the data associated with that object is one integer, and it's uh, stored, I'm storing the value 222, 222. And of course, A3 is another um, num object, I expand it, its value, um, its integer value is 333. Three, three. Okay, so now I'm going to, um, we'll go to the output screen and step over. There's the output before calling the change values. I'm going to output um, uh, kind of a header, if you will. And then I'm going to output A1, tab A2, A3. And there they are. 111. One, one, and because A2 is a reference to this um, object, we'll actually call the toString method and output 222, call the toString method output 333. So pretty straightforward so far. Now, now we're going to call, this modifier object is going to call change values. And we're going to pass A1, A2, and A3. So here we go. And here we are in the change values method. And I've got a breakpoint here. We've already printed out before changing the values F1, right, which is the formal parameter that A1 was passed to. And F2, the formal parameter that A2 was passed to, and F3, formal parameter that A3 was passed to, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Wow, that was a mouthful. So now we're going to change F1 to 999. Now remember, that primitive variable A1 was passed by value. Just remember these lessons from the prerequisite course on pass by value, pass by reference. So let's uh, step in. Now we're going to call the set value method from num, and we're going to set the value <coughs> that F2 of the object F2 is, is pointing to. It's an F2 and A1, A2 are now aliases to that object. And that's been changed. So if I'm coming down here and I'm looking at F2, it's now pointing at an object that has an integer that holds 888. But F3 is going to be assigned, we're going to use the constructor, a new num object, and its integer variable is going to be set to 777. Now think about this. F3 is no longer going to be an object reference or an alias to A3. Here we go. And so now F3. So we've got F1, 999, F2, num object 888, F3, num object 777. So we'll finish, send some output to the screen. If you look at the output, there it is. There's the output from the method. Let's keep going. And now we're back in main of the parameter tester application that we started with. Now we'll print new header, and we'll print A1, A2, and A3. A1 is 111, because it was passed by value. And even though we changed F1, F1 was a parameter that received its value like an assignment statement. It was a copy of A1. at A2. A2 was changed. We changed the value. We set the value that the object, we used the set value method to change the value of the variable in the object. 
and A1, A2 and F2 were both pointing to the same object. A3 is back to 333 because A3 is still pointing to that original, here it is, that original num object that held 333. We didn't change the value of that object. What we did with F3 was we assigned it as an object reference to a new instance of the num object, of the num class. We'll discuss this further in the next slide. Here we have a graphic depiction of all of those steps and the variables, object reference and primitive variables that exist. So initially we have A1 declared as a primitive integer assigned 111. A2, we used a constructor to um, create a new instance of the num class and its object reference variable was A2. And we set the value to 222. Same thing with A3. Step two, we passed A1, A2, and A3 to the change values method as parameters. A copy of A1, because it's a primitive variable, a copy of A1 was used to initialize F1. F2 is now an alias of A2, both pointing to the object whose variable, whose integer variable holds the value 222. Same thing with A3. Step three, we changed, we assigned 999 to F1. So now, because F1 had its own memory space, a new primitive variable within the scope of that method, it holds 999. And um, back in the method that called that, A1 still holds 111. Okay, step four. We call the set value method of num in the num class to change the value of the integer variable, which is being pointed to, referenced by A2 and F2 to 888. Step five, we use the constructor to create a new instance of the num class, a new object set its value to 777 and assign the object reference variable three to that object or that object to three, I should, F3, okay? So now we still have A3 pointing to the old object, which has a variable, integer variable that's stored in 333 and F3 is pointing to a new num object that holds the value 777 in its integer variable. So after we return from change values and we wanna print A1, A2, and A3, the only value that's different from the first time we printed them is A2 because we use set value to change the value of the integer in that object. And that object, A2, was an object reference variable pointing to that object. So we did in fact change the value that A2 was referencing. But A3 is still pointing to the original object. F3 is pointing to a different object. And A1, we could not have changed because it was passed call by value. I strongly urge you to download those files, put them in a project and play around with this. You have to understand these concepts where you will be lost moving forward. I'm not trying to give you a hard time, actually trying to help you. Next, we're covering a topic that is um, review of a concept we covered in the prerequisite for this class. Method overloading, same as function overloading in C++. <clears throat> so, process of giving a single method name multiple definitions it's just like we did in um, well if you took me for the prerequisite class <clears throat> I used the, uh, the pizza ordering system where we write um, functions to calculate 
the, the unit price of a pizza and we uh, write one function, in this case it would be a method, that calculates the price of a round pizza. So I think we pass it the radius or diameter and the price and it calculates the price per square inch. And then we use the same name and we calculate a rectangular pizza and we give it three parameters, length, width, and price. Obviously it uses different uh, calculations for uh, to calculate the area, but <clears throat> same thing. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> so if the method is overloaded, uh, the signature of each overloaded method has to be unique and the signature is the same as what we call the function declaration in C++, includes the number, type, and order of the parameters. When you have overloaded methods, the compiler determines which <clears throat> actual method is being invoked by analyzing the signature or the parameter list, if you will. Here's an example of an overloaded method named try me. Um, it's, it's first uh, definition uh, takes a single integer as its uh, single parameter. Uh, the second overloaded method has two parameters, an integer and a float. So if we invoke try meth or try me, and pass 25 and 4.32, it's going to invoke the second overloaded method. Print line method is overloaded because its parameter may be a string, it may be an int, maybe a double, so on. Um, the following lines invoke different versions of the print line method, different overloaded versions. System out the print line, the total is the string the total is or system out dot print line total in java the return type of the method is not considered part of the signature therefore overloaded methods cannot differ only by the return type you can't have the same parameter and a same parameter list number and type and have a different return type constructors can be overloaded. And the overloaded constructors provide multiple ways to initialize a new object. The last topic covered in this very long and very important chapter is testing and debugging. Testing is the act of running a completed program with various inputs, what I typically call test data, to discover problems. And any evaluation that is performed by us mere humans or a machine to assess the quality of the evolving system. So the goal of testing is to find errors. And testing a program can never guarantee the absence of errors. Um, I've seen programs in production for years before an error was detected and a change order was required. You heard me reference test data. Running a program with a specific input or set of inputs and knowing what the correct output should be establishes only that the program works for that particular input. As more and more test cases are run uh, without uncovering errors, then confidence, uh, we build confidence in the program. But um, that doesn't mean that the program is error-free. Well-designed test cases are the key to thorough testing. And if an error, an error is found, we have to determine the cause of that error, document it, and fix it. And then rerun the previous test cases, all of the previous test cases, to ensure that we didn't introduce new errors. This is called regression testing.
Design reviews, or sometimes just called reviews, are an integral part of testing and debugging. A review typically involves um, several people meeting together to examine a design document or a section of code and then presenting that design or code and allowing individuals to provide suggestions, feedback, um, comments. Okay, the goal of a review is to identify particular problems. And a design review should determine if the system requirements are addressed. One thing we have to keep in mind when we're testing, and testing is, is sometimes referred to as defect testing. Although in my career, I, I, I didn't ever use that term and never had that term used um, by people upstream or downstream of me, but that's okay. Um, er errors are going to most certainly exist within our programs. So we have to use test cases or test data. And a test case is a set of inputs or initial conditions, and we already have the expected output. So we're running input, user actions, initial conditions are all set, and we run the program, and then we get an output that we already have documented. I can give you an example. Um, many years ago when I was a programmer, at Boeing, we had to write a program that created a three-dimensional um, uh, offset of a surface. And that surface was the outside of the aircraft. And so we needed to calculate the three-dimensional offset of the inside of the surface. The outside was created by a program, um, fluid dynamics program. It was the actual airfoil surface of the aircraft. And it came to us as an array of uh, three-dimensional or Cartesian coordinates, which are XYZ coordinates. It's a very complex data set for the time. And so as we were doing this, we had the engineers calculate the actual, and it was a lot of manual calculation, the three-dimensional offset for a small surface area, test data, and calculate the actual values of the inside offset. It was like 50 thousandths of an inch was the offset we plugged in. And then we were able to compare our inside surface to theirs. And we actually made uh, physical models of each of the surfaces using a three-dimensional routing machine, uh, milling machine actually it was out in the factory. It was a very, very labor-intensive process to prove these um, these programs. So it wouldn't be feasible for us to create test cases for every airfoil surface that we were going to create offsets for. There is at some point in time a leap of faith. Um, but in, in, in those instances, the programs we we're writing were actually going to be used in the manufacturing process. And there could be physical measurements with high precision measuring devices to calculate those. So we didn't normally test every single situation, but we, in that case, in that particular scenario, we were uh, creating data that was then being used downstream to make a physical object that could be physically measured from the airfoil surface. And there was a lot of analysis that went into making sure that was correct before we then use that program in other areas, all other areas of the aircraft to calculate the inside surface of that aircraft at various skin thicknesses. Let's discuss two approaches to defect testing. <clears throat> the first is called black box. It treats the thing, method, class, etc whatever's being tested is a black box. In other words, 
the test cases are developed without regard to the internal workings. Input data is often selected uh, by defining equivalence categories. In other words, um, the test data includes a collection of inputs along with the produced outputs, the expected outputs. So an example uh, input to a method that computes the square root could be divided into two categories, negative and non-negative, but not particularly worrying about the coding of the method, just making sure these selected inputs, which are representative of the types of inputs that method will be handling, generate the appropriate outputs. Second approach to defect testing is white box testing. <clears throat> and white box testing um, does not disregard the internal structure or coding of uh, or implementation of a method. So the test cases are based on the logic of the code that is being tested. And the goal is to ensure that every particular path through a program is executed at least once. If you recall the Pig Latin translator that we covered earlier in this chapter, we had, it begins with a consonant, it begins with a vowel, or it begins with a, what do we call that? I can't remember, combination, like B-R-T-R-S-H. Um, and we would test each one of those paths through the implementation and coding of that particular method. Other levels or hierarchy of testing types, unit testing, integration testing, system testing. So unit testing creates a test case for each module of code that's being authored and making sure that that particular module um, uh, works appropriately. And then integration testing, so the modules that were unit tested are then tested as a collection. And this form of testing looks at the larger picture and sees if bugs are present when modules are brought together. And then obviously system testing uh, tests the entire software system and how it adheres to the requirements. This is also um, what was called beta testing um, when I was a programmer. And here you can see it's also known as alpha or beta testing now. Another approach is test-driven development in which um, test cases are written as the source code is being developed. And some de developers have uh, adopted this style known as test-driven development where the test cases are written first. And then only enough source code is implemented to, um, so that those test cases will pass. Before I go any further, let me introduce some sage advice to you because all of these testing strategies, debugging strategies, test case strategies are great and you should know them and they cause you to think critically. But as what happened with me, when you get your first job as a programmer, you are most likely going to be introduced to a scheme or a company protocol that might utilize some of these, but is different. So uh, don't be too rigid in your approach to testing and debugging, documentation, etc. So test-driven development sequence is that you create a test case that will test a specific method that has yet to be completed. So you know what the inputs, conditions, and states are and what um, the state change will be when the method is complete. Okay, so you 
then execute all the test cases, present and verify that all test cases will pass except for the most recently implemented test case. And you develop the method that the test case targets. So the test case will pass without errors. Then you re-execute all the test cases and verify that every test case passes, including the most recently created test case. And then you clean up the code to eliminate any redundant portions, which is also referred to as refactoring. And then you, repeat the, you, re, you continue to repeat the process, starting with step one. You've already seen me use some debugging techniques, step into, step over, step out of, breakpoints, etc. in the ID, the NetBeans IDE debugging is a tool in your toolbox um, that helps you to locate and correct runtime and logic errors in programs. Um, errors can be located in programs in many ways. Um, you may notice a runtime error, which causes a program termination. You may notice a logic error during execution that's a little harder to find. Through rigorous testing, we have to discover all possible errors. Um, I, I don't like the statement, however, typically a few errors slip through into the final program. I don't know about that. I mean, it depends on your perspective on the term final program. But we do have a debugger in NetBeans IDE, and it's very similar to the debugger you used in the prerequisite course and we'll be using it throughout. But if you don't take time to utilize that and look at the variables, look at the data, look at the objects, the object reference variables, etc., you're cheating yourself. You really are. Probably the most basic debugging tool is use of print and print line. OK? Um, if you're wondering how the value of certain variables are changed or the state of objects uh, at various points in the program are impacted, okay, you can simply output variables, identifiers, using the print line. I, I call this tracing, tracing the value of variables through the, uh, the program. And so it can be very useful to print the value of each parameter after the method starts. We just saw this in the program that had the num class and the parameter modifier. Um, it was very, very useful. And it can be very particularly useful with recursive methods, methods that call themselves. So formal debuggers um, allow us to set one or more breakpoints, pauses in the program that allow us to take a state snapshot and see the variables that are in scope. Uh, we can print the value of a variable or an object. We can step into one statement at a time, step into step over, step out of a particular method, execute just a single statement, and then resume ex execution of the program. These are all critical tools in the testing and debugging toolbox that you must become familiar with. I know if you had me for the prerequisite class, we use these, and I sometimes became a little frustrated in class because some students were running their program not getting output that they expected and said, Professor, I don't understand what's going on, yet they didn't have a single breakpoint or they weren't stepping into, stepping over, stepping out of specific function calls. So they were driving blind. And I'm not saying this to make you feel bad. I'm saying this to help you, to empower you, especially since this course is going to be taught online for the first time ever because of the pandemic. So. We are in uncharted waters, and I'm really going to ask you to, um, to get familiar with the debugger.
Now, once again, I'm going to be available synchronously as much as you need me, as much as you could tolerate me during this unique time. And so we'll be uh, moving forward. And I may even teach this, use these slides to teach this class online again later. We'll see. So that's the end of this most critical chapter, chapter five. And like I said, all of the files, the, um, the applications and class definitions are in the timeline in Canvas for you to use. Download them, put them into a project, um, and, and test them, run them over and over again. Use a debugger, use breakpoints. You really need to if you're going to understand this enough to move forward and be successful in this class. Thanks and have a great day.